first of all, of course, I want to thank the organizers to for giving me this opportunity. So um, this is um, well, this is my first uh, foray into number theory seminar. All right, so um, let me start this. Oops, it's not okay. Okay, so um, I will we'll start with some uh, rather old questions. Um, which motivate um, the investigation uh, in this talk. And um, there are two questions. So we start with um, a field of um, algebraic numbers, uh, possibly an infinite extension of Q. And um, we have a ring of integers um, of that field. And what we want to know is, is there a first order definition um, of Z over this ring uh, of integers in the language of rings? And is the first order theory of uh, the ring of <clears throat> integers undecidable? So uh, if you may be unfamiliar with uh, all this terminology, I will explain it shortly. First of all, What's the first order language of rings? The short version is that it is um, a language of polynomial equations. You could think um, of a sentence in this language um, as being a conjunction of polynomial um, equations, and it's prefaced by some collections of quantifiers. So if I'm thinking about a sentence as opposed to a formula. So all variables will be in the range of um, some quantifier. So um, the coefficients of the polynomial may be in Z or we can augment um, our language by adding countably many constant symbols to name elements of the ring. So there's some silly sentences you can write. Okay, so um, the first sentence is clearly true for, while well, I'm thinking about community frames uh, with identity, nothing strange. And the first sentence is obviously true in every ring. The second sentence is true over some rings. And the third sentence is false in all rings. So, I mean, it's natural for us to want to know which sentences um, of the language are true over a given ring. So the collection of all sentences that are true over a particular ring is called the first order theory of the ring. And we say that the first order theory is decidable if we have an algorithm uh, which can decide, given a sentence, whether it's true or not. Otherwise, we will call the theory of the ring undecidable. You can also use language of rings to define subsets. And the basic idea is that you leave uh, one variable outside the range of your quantifiers and then the set you are defining is the set um, of values in the ring for which the sentence is going to be true. Um, okay, so there are some uh, silly definitions and there are not so silly definitions. So for example, this is the definition of um, the set of even integers uh, over the. And it's obviously very easy to tell what's going on. Um, on the other hand, if you write something random, like some random polynomial of random degree, um, and you want to know what kind of a set you have defined, it may be quite difficult. For example, I have no idea what's defined over Z by uh, the formula, by the sentence I've written. It's also easy to see that the difficulty of deciding what you have defined uh, depends on the ring you're looking at. So if instead of Z, I look 
at the ring of all algebraic integers, then I can tell what's going on in particular that I have defined just the ring of all algebraic integers. Okay, so um, it could be that one of the sets you are interested in defining is actually a sub ring of a given ring. Now, um, why would you wanna do that? Well, there is some connection between definability and decidability. And the connection is if you start say with the ring R1 contained in a ring R2, and the first order theory of R1 is undecidable and R1 happens to have a first order definition over the bigger ring R2, then we can conclude that the first order theory of R2 is also undecidable. Because if it were decidable, then we could use the algorithm for deciding the truth of sentences over R2 and the first order definition of R1 over R2 to have <clears throat> to construct an algorithm for deciding the truth of sentences over R1. All right, so the first ring undecidability result um, <coughs> though is due to Hilbert, Bernays, that somewhere like they had a, several volumes on logic, it's buried somewhere there, I understand. And it also was in a paper by Rother. And as you see, these results um, are quite old. And of course, the ring of question was Z. So it was shown that um, the first order theory of Z was undecidable. And that, uh, of course, is the beginning of all the other results about undecidability. So if we apply the reasoning um, from the previous slide with the smaller ring being Z, then we will conclude that if the answer to the first question is yes, oops, then the answer to the second question is also yes. Yeah. So the first, uh, the answer to the first question will give us actually more information than the answer to the second question. Sometimes we um, can give a definition of a set which is uniform of a collection um, of objects of rings. Um, so here's what we mean by that um, because the notion of uniformity can vary depending on the context. Okay, so let K be a field of algebraic numbers, L a collection of extensions of K in its algebraic closure, and A a subset of the ring of integers of the algebraic closure. So we say that A has a uniform first order definition of a rings of integers of all fields in L if there is a single polynomial equation. So um, it has two sorts of variables, T, and then there are Xs. Um, and only T is, of course, is not um, in the range of any quantifier. And the formula QT uh, <clears throat> gives a definition of the intersection uh, of our set A with a particular ring of integers, say, of the field L, uh, for every field L in our collection. So, so one polynomial works for every field in the collection. Um, there is one very easy set um, to define uniformly, and that's the set of units, right? So let U be the set of all units um, in OQ bar. Then for any uh, field K contained in Q bar, we have that the units uh, of the ring of integers of that field are defined uh, by a very simple formula. So, now <clears throat> in describing the language of the rings, we stated 
that um, given a formula in that language, we can add both universal and existential quantifiers. Now, we can restrict ourselves to using just existential quantifiers. So the result of this will be a so-called existential language of rings. And the corresponding theory will be the existential theory of the ring. And then the question of decidability of that existential theory is essentially Hilbert stamp problem for the ring. And um, there is the same connection about existential definability and existential decidability um, as uh, the connection between first order definability and first order decidability. Okay, so a bit more history. So um, the story for us starts with results of Julia Robinson from 1949, when she produced a definition of Z for rings of integers of every number field, and thus showing that the first order theory of these rings is undecidable. Her definition was of a simple form. It just had one universal quantifier followed by some existential quantifiers, but it explicitly used the degree of the extension. Later on, she produced a uniform definition um, of the across the rings of integers of all number fields, but the uniform formula was more complicated. Of course, by now we have existential definitions of Z of rings of integers of many number fields. So Dino for the first person to show that Z has an existential definition over a ring of algebraic integers of a number field. And he was looking at extensions of degree two. This, <clears throat> his result was followed by many more, some results of his and um, Lipschitz and um, other people. And so here's a list of people, not in historical order, but just in alphabetical order. Um, who produced some definitions, uh, existential definitions of Z um, over number fields. So in 2010, Mesa and Rubin showed that Shafarevich state conjecture implies that there exists an existential definition of Z over ring, <coughs> rings of integers of any number field. And later on in a paper of Murti and Pastan and another paper of Pastan, it was shown that other conjectures um, will reach the same conclusion. So what this means that uh, assuming any one of those conjectures is that Hilbert's stamp problem is undecidable over uh, a ring of integers of any number field. Okay, so um, due to results of Julia Robinson, we have a pretty good um, understanding of the first order theory of rings of integers of number fields. But it's quite different when we look at infinite algebraic extensions of Q. For one thing, there are infinite extensions where the first order theory of a ring of integers is decidable, and there are other ones where it's not decidable. For example, um, the results of Rowley and Van den Dries showed that uh, first order theory of um, a ring of wall algebraic integers is decidable. And um, it's also more annoying that sometimes the status of the first order theory of the ring of integers and its fraction field can be different. For example, the first order theory of the field of all totally real algebraic numbers is decidable. So that's a result of Fried, Haran, and Falkland. And the first order theory of the ring of all totally real algebraic integers is undecidable. And that's the result of Julia Robinson from 62. So Julia Robinson was the first person to produce example of infinite algebraic extension of Q with the first order theory of the ring of integers is undecidable. So she developed a method for constructing first order definitions of Z for rings of totally real integers and a method for constructing a first order model of Z and also thus proving undecidability uh, for some rings of integers that are not totally real. So, Julia Robinson's methods 
were used and generalized for totally real rings of <clears throat> algebraic integers and rings of algebraic integers of degree two extensions of totally real fields by a number of mathematicians. So, so here's the, the <clears throat> below is the partial list of people who um, have produced such results. All right, so moving on to our contribution to the literature. And um, so in our case, the decidability or oh, so our undecidability results do not so much depend on um, whether the field is totally real or an extension of degree two of a totally real field, but whether the field is not big. So what do we mean by uh, a big field? Well, one way you could think about it, so the field is big if it contains um, a sub-extension uh, with a degree <clears throat> over Q divisible by N for any integer N. So. Um, and here is um, uh, one of our main theorems. And so if A is a collection of all non-big fields, of algebraic numbers, there exists a first order formula of the form, so two universal quantifiers followed by some existential quantifiers, uniformly defining the um, over the rings of integers of all fields in A. And that, of course, in particular says that the first order theory of the ring of integers of all non big fields is undecidable. And we also have um, a consequence which pertains to fields. Um, and the consequence says if K is a non big Galois extension of Q, then the first order theory of the field K is undecidable. And that follows from the fact that uh, in the Galois, Galois extension, which is not big, in such an extension, you can give a first order definition um, of integers over the field. And then if you remember from earlier slides, that tells you that the first order theory of the field is undecidable. Okay, so now I'll try to give you a flavor of um, our proof. Okay, so the proof starts with a very simple idea, right? So um, if you are in any ring, well, let's say ring of characteristic zero, that it's still the sentence is still true in uh, positive characteristic, but we are mostly we are discussing rings of characteristic zero only, so I might as well assume that. So um, this is a simple formula from algebra: that x to the n minus one divided by x minus one is equivalent to n modular x minus one. So. All right, so you take this formula and um, you take it to an extreme, if you wish. So uh, you start with some algebraic extension of Q and uh, let U sub K be the group of units of <clears throat> the ring of integers of K. And then you look um, at the set defined in the following fashion. So X is on the set, the subset of the ring of integers. If and only if uh, for every unit different from one, there is another unit such that X is equivalent to um, this ratio modulo the original unit minus one. So, you know, we are motivated by that simple formula I just showed you before, because we know that the set R sub K will contain all positive integers because we can always take uh, Delta to be epsilon to the power n. Now, the fact that I denoted this, um, that um, 
by R sub K, of course, makes you suspect that the set, in fact, is a ring. And it is. I mean, so there's some um, not very difficult exercises that um, show that the set, the set has happened to be closed under addition. And basically, multiplication um, of deltas in the formula ends up being um, uh, correspond to uh, sums of x's. So, and of course, it's enough to prove it um, for two uh, x one <clears throat> for two um, elements of R sub k, and it's just a silly algebra exercise. Um, to see that it works uh, for two elements uh, of R sub K. And uh, it's also the set R sub K is also happens to be closed under multiplication. It's also not um, a particularly difficult proof. So if you have X and Y in R sub K, Right, and for every epsilon um, of u sub k, you need to satisfy a certain congruence. So you start uh, with observing that since x is in R sub k, I have the requisite delta in u sub k to satisfy the congruence. But then since um, y is also in R sub k, then I can use the original delta as the epsilon and find another delta delta prime to satisfy the congruence with epsilon replaced by delta. So the end result shows you that the product is also in our sub k. And the uh, Final exercise is to um, note that uh, minus one is also an element of R sub K and that uh, will complete the proof that that's in fact the ring. Again, it's just a, an exercise with some congruences, um, but the end result is that minus one is equivalent to epsilon to the minus one minus one divided by epsilon minus one, modular epsilon minus one. Okay, so we now know, so we have a ring of integers and we can define a sub ring of that ring of integers using the units. So what do we get? Well, of course it depends. Now, um, if we start with imaginary quadratic fields, um, then the situation is not very difficult simply because the imaginary quadratic extensions of Q do not have that many units. And you can directly see what all the possible outcomes. So the first proposition is, is not difficult to see. The second proposition is a lot harder. So here you want to know, uh, are there any circumstances where the ring you have defined is actually the original ring? And uh, it is the case if every polynomial of the form x to the d a times x to the d minus one plus b has a root in your field. Now it's clear that if F is algebraic closure of Q, that it will satisfy this condition for having roots to these polynomials. Of course, a much more interesting question is, are there other fields with the same property? And we do not know the answer to that. Okay, so, in general, what we have, so if K is an algebraic extension of Q that is not big, then either R sub K is B or R sub K is an order in some imaginary quadratic field F contained in K. 
Now it follows from this theorem that if KSA contains two different quadratic imaginary extensions of Q, only one of these extensions can potentially contain R sub K. Now, this asymmetry seems entirely unnatural. I mean, how does R K select which uh, quadratic imaginary extension to land in? So that leads us to suspect that actually um, what happens is that if we start with something which is not an imaginary quadratic field, then RK is going to be Z always, whether K contains an imaginary quadratic field or not. It's just too strange that the process of constructing R sub K would discriminate between quadratic imaginary extensions of Q contained in K. Okay, now our initial goal was after all to define Z. And so there could be an impediment, right? We cannot show that R sub K is always going to be Z even for non-big fields, the ring of integers of non-big fields. So we have to do some work to compensate for the fact that uh, we can land in a quadratic imaginary subfield uh, of our original field instead of Q. Uh, fortunately, it's not that big of a deal because you can um, modify uh, the original results of Deneuve to show that there is a uniform existential formula defining Z of the ring of integers of any imaginary quadratic field. And basically what you need to do, you append this uniform existential definition to the definition of R sub K, and then you will get Z. Um, so, so far, it looks like to define Z of the ring of integers of a non-big field, we need just one universal quantifier. So an element, X and OK is actually in Z if and only if the conjunction of the following statements is true. So the first you recognize that's a construction of R sub K, and then we um, append some existential statements in case we do land in a quadratic imaginary extension of Q instead of Q. Okay. But in this case, appearances are deceiving if you look more closely. So the problem is we're not allowed to quantify over the set of units. So the best we can do is a statement of the following sorts. So you start with two elements of OK, and either you're looking at units, and more specifically, uh, units not equal to one, and then essentially you do what we did in the previous slide, or you don't have a unit. So that's the uh, the other term in the disjunction. So in order to get rid of the second universal quantifier, for the case epsilon is not a unit, we would need a uniform existential definition of non-units. But uh, we don't know how to construct such a definition or even if it exists. So um, at the moment, we are stuck with two universal quantifiers. All right, so there is um, another interesting field um, where we um, can say something using this methodology. And the field is, uh, field we call Q up is the largest abelian extension of Q. So the question of decidability or undecidability of the ring of integers of Q up is also a rather old one, still unanswered. So what do we know? We know that, uh, we know that, um, there is a subextension of degree two of Q up, 
the field we call Q up plus. Uh, it's the field of all totally real algebraic numbers contained in an abelian extension. And that ring uh, of integers has an undecidable first order theory by um, a result of Julia Robinson. Now, Cunningsman conjectured in 2014 uh, that the ring of integers of that totally real extension has a first order definition over the ring of integers of QR. Of course, the existence of such a definition would now imply that the theory of OQR is undecidable. Our methodology provides a slightly different approach to the problem of showing that the theory of OQAP is um, undecidable. So before we get to um, QAP, we need to revisit some properties of um, the rings we construct. Now, the idea here is that instead of using uh, the full group of units to define O sub K, we can actually use a subgroup of units. Um, it will also generate um, a ring, but essentially by the same argument as for the full group of units. But of course, it can very well be a different ring depending on the field and the subgroup. So, um, so under some circumstances, the group generated by the subgroup of units can land you in a subfield. So um, if it happens, okay, so if F is a subfield of K and VK contains elements of infinite order and the subgroup itself happens to live in the subfield, then the ring we will produce um, will be a, a subring of the rings of integers of F. So we will land in a subfield. And the other um, modification one can make, well, maybe I should say one can choose a particular subgroup V sub K. And the subgroup <clears throat> will first of all consist of nth powers of um, units. And all those units um, will be required to be equivalent to one modular sum ideal. So what happens um, in this case is you get some other ring, but the original ring times n will be uh, sitting inside the new ring. Now, um, it takes some work to show that the first part of this lemma is true, but the second part um, of this lemma is not hard to show. And uh, we will use some properties of um, our rings. So what we want to show is if we start with an element of our original ring R sub K, that N times this element will land in the new ring. So let's choose an epsilon in the subgroup. Now, since our element X, was an R sub K, there must be a delta in U sub K such that the required equivalence is satisfied with that delta. Of course, we're not done yet because delta is only in the group of units. It's not necessarily in the subgroup. If you remember, delta has to be an nth power of some other unit. Now the requirement that delta is equivalent to one modular selected ideal, that will be satisfied automatically if we select epsilon in the subgroup, because then epsilon itself will be equivalent to one modular that ideal, and it will force the same thing on delta. All right, so what we can do is use our addition lemma, which basically tells you that uh, multiplication of delta leads to addition of x's. Uh, here's a reminder of, um, of that lemma. So, and we will apply this lemma 
So with all x's being equal to x and all deltas being equal to delta. So the end result will be, so we add all x's, so we'll have n of them, and we multiply all deltas, so we'll have delta to the power n, and uh, we get this new equivalence. So, but delta to the n is now in the required uh, subgroup. So what we see is that n times x is going to be in this new ring. Okay, so, um, so how are we going to use in our situation? So if k is an extension of degree two with totally real field, and k itself is not an imaginary quadratic field, um, and f, the maximal um, real subfield of K, then what will happen is then our ring R sub K is going to be sitting inside this totally real subfield. Well, why so? First of all, let's choose a subgroup and the subgroup will <clears throat> contain only squares of units of the original field. And every unit will have to be equivalent to one modular some integer bigger than one. Um, then, okay, that's uh, an exercise to show that units like that are actually totally real. I mean, basically, the argument depends on the fact that if you go from totally real number field to a totally complex extension of degree two, the rank of unit groups do not change. So that's so. Uh... So now we will use our lemma on subgroups and sum fields, right? Just uh, oops, to remind you what it was. This lemma, this part, the second part um, of this lemma. In our case, n is going to be two. So, um, what we conclude is that two times our original ring R sub k is a ring generated by the subgroup V sub k, but the subgroup sits inside the totally real. Field. So we conclude that two times R sub K is in the real subfield. Well, then of course, R sub K itself has to be in the real subfield. So um, if we are looking at an extension of degree two, um, totally complex extension of degree two of a totally real field, then um, R sub K is going to be contained in this totally real field. Okay, so if we apply um, this argument to OQ up, what we will see that OQ up contains a first order definable totally real subring. Now, this totally real subring is not necessarily a ring of integers of any field. <clears throat> it may be smaller, but um, we can, it, it takes very little effort to actually convert it to a, a ring of integers of some totally real field contained in q -up. Now, Julia Robinson um, conjectures in 1962 that the first order theory of any totally real ring of integers is undecidable. Of course, this conjecture would immediately <clears throat> imply, given our result, that first order theory woke you up is undecidable. But in fact, we don't need to conjecture that much. It's enough to conjecture that the first order theory of the ring of integers of every totally real abelian extension of Q is undecidable to deduce the undecidability of uh, first order theory of OQM. And, or alternatively, um, we can try to figure out exactly what we have defined. What is this ring R sub VQM 
that is defined using units and try to see whether the first order theory um, of that is undecidable. And as usual, I finish ahead of time. <laughs> 